this is just a small presentation on SuperSIDs and the SuperSID project. So first of all, you have to say, what is a so we have a problem research. in that there are big black boxes where you probably see boxes in the top right and the top. You, you can't see half the screen, is that what you're saying? Uh, we see up to ionosphere minus typical, but we only see typic. There's a big box to the yeah. right. Yeah, okay, that's all the... We'll take us out all the way. Is that better? There it goes. That's improved now, just the top, but I'm not sure you have control of that one. Thank you. No, that's all right. That's all zoom at the top. Right. A sudden ionospheric disturbance is typically when we have a solar flare, you get an accompanying X ray or ultraviolet radiation. Or alternatively, you could have a coronal mass ejection, which emits particles. So, Radio waves propagate by bouncing off the ionosphere, and any changes that affect the ionosphere affects the way the radio waves propagate. So if we continuously monitor a signal strength from a certain transmitter, then that transmitter power is always going to be the same. So any change in signal strength is due to changes in the ionosphere. And the super signal monitor is designed to detect those changes. So a typical output from a super SID monitor is shown below. We normally look from 0 to 48 kilohertz, and the radio transmitters in the US all cluster in around here. So some of those spikes are probably interference, some of them are actually transmitters. And what the program does is it monitors certain frequencies, which you set in the configuration file, and it just keeps a track of those frequencies and the signal strength 24 hours a day, basically. Plots them out every five seconds or so. And so a normal plot, when you put them all together to a single transmitter, you can see the signal strength is high overnight, dips down, comes to a sort of steady state during the day, dips up at night, goes off again. And so what happens when you have a solar flare is that that normally flat distribution actually has peaks in it because it increases the signal strength from those transmitters. And that's how you detect solar flares. So the SuperSID monitor the data. Um, we have monitors all around the world in most countries. The information is uploaded to the Stanford data repository. And you can either choose to upload your data or not, depending on how you, want, how you feel. Um, you can switch it on and off in the configuration file. There are 965 monitors in the world at the moment. Um, the data is freely available for anyone to use and it's being used in a number of studies. Each monitor has a unique identifier and the location and owner of each station is known from the form that we ask each user to fill out when ordering a SuperSID monitor. And it is important to fill out that form so that we know where the monitor is located, who's using it, how to get in touch if we have any queries about the data being sent into the repository. And this is what is normally sent out when you buy a kit. The small bit in the bottom there is the actual SuperSID monitor. It's basically just a, a preamp for your an audio card. It just increases the sensitivity. That's the audio card there that we use. You can send that. If you, you can use the one on your own computer if you want to. Um, most of the modern ones nowadays are good enough to use. Um, but if you don't, then that's a good one that we send out. Then you've got some coax cable and some antenna wire. And so basically so you build yourself a little antenna like that, connect it by the coax, connect it to the SuperSID, connect it to your computer, and run the software. Now, the software at the moment is Windows only, um, and that's the only client that's being supported. But other people want to use Linux, um, especially for something like a Raspberry Pi. So Steve Burl, who works at Stanford, he's been working on 
a Linux client. So, a number somebody Eric Gibert started in 2013 and was working on a, a Linux client, and his code is freely available that that all if you want to go and look at it. But in January 2021, Steve Bell decided to create a fork and continue development because Eric had lost interest and was no longer supporting or enhancing the code. And so his fork is at that particular role. And the reason why he did it was basically because Windows XP was getting so difficult to use. There were settings where so settings would change. Updates were getting stored and things like that. Uh, so basically, it wasn't really good enough for running a data collection, 24 7 data collection system. Linux will run on any hardware, including very old computers. So you don't need to dedicate a, an expensive computer to this. The Raspberry Pi um, is also very good, a small computer, so inexpensive. And Linux, you can use headless if you want to various other factors. So the platforms he's tried this on are the Raspberry Pi and a few old Dell desktop computers. Um, it should work on any machine capable of running Linux, but he's only really tested it on systems which use Debian. And it should work with any sound card that is supported by the ALSA Linux sound architecture, architecture um, which is most cars and others. So he's changed Eric's original work slightly. Um, it's brought it up to Python 3, which is a current standard for Python 3. Um, and he's changing to how the GUI works. Uh, the known issues are lack of documentation um, because it's just a sort of part-time project for him. He's not really documented it. Uh, there are a few known bugs, some documents and not. The automatic upload of data to Stanford isn't working. And some have had issues with specific sound cards. Um, as I say, it's a part-time job for him. He's always looking for help. He wants other people to join in and try and work around this so that we can extend the range of computers that the SuperSuite will work on. Um, and that's really what he's saying. He wants to be able to get the bugs fixed, get the automatic uploading working reliably, improve the documentation. Getting help from the community is one thing he really wants. Um, all the code is available for free in the GitHub repository. And basically, he wants to make a just make it so that everybody can use it on Linux machines, not just Windows. Because, as we say, the only system we spoil it running on is Windows, and a lot of people want it to run on Linux. Um, so, if you do, then you can either try what's available at the moment or you can go in and improve it yourself. Okay. Did everybody get that? Yeah, it sounded great. Thank okay. Can can I ask a question about the Stanford side of things? They they are open to receiving data though, right? That's not the problem with uploading to Stanford. No, no, the system works and it's still working. You know, it's kept it's maintained and kept running. Um, if you do have problems uploading, it's probably something in, in between, the data is being recorded as we speak. So, okay, good. Bob, I've had my uh, super SID for five years. I've been uploading for five years, and any issue has always been mine. It's a very yeah. good system. Yeah, I've had one too, but I haven't had it actually operational. I had it out and and almost operational, but now the sun has deteriorated the wire, and I'm going to have to redo the antenna, I believe. I don't know if you've had that problem or not, but I, I'm, I'm thinking there should be a better insulation wire possibly on future ones. Uh, my, my wires are fine. It's the, the support structure that got deteriorated on mine. So, uh, and the wind uh, knocked it over a couple of times. So, all right. 
Jonathan, outstanding. Um, and uh, anybody, uh, so there's a couple couple ideas here for, uh, now Jonathan's doing an outstanding job on uh, fielding. Uh, I see all the emails, uh, people requesting super SIDS um, and through the grant program through Tom Crowley asking for super SIDS. So he's been fielding all of the uh, processing and shipping uh, data out. He's also the one that's gonna be providing the super SID kits for the people uh, that won the raffles for this uh, conference. So he's done an outstanding job on that. I think uh, anybody who wants to work with Steve Burrell to do development on Super SID, uh, especially that Linux program would go a long way. And the other thing that uh, I did a little bit of um, is uh, trying to get the archive data for the Super SID program. Uh, there's been a couple efforts to uh, um, use the Super SID around the world to, to look for earthquakes, uh, to look for uh, I was able to uh, use Super SID to uh, track the uh, eclipse because an eclipse looks like a day-night variation uh, in the ionosphere. That works very well. So there's lots of eclipses around the world. Uh, if you got a Super SID in the area, you might be able to pick up an eclipse. So all sorts of things, nice science things. It's also been the most reliable uh, radio telescope that I've ever owned. Uh, there's no maintenance sits there and it, it produces data and you can look at it if you want. Uh, also, Rodney Howe is the uh, coordinator for the AFSO group uh, who collects, is looking for observers. He collects this data and they uh, compare it with the solar flare data uh, from GOES and stuff on a monthly basis. So uh, I've been submitting that monthly to him. So, uh, so there's all sorts of super SID projects, solar flare projects. It's great for students and, you know, I've been doing it for five years and I still enjoy it. So I uh, highly recommend that. Uh, see Jonathan, uh, I can help you aim at stuff. And uh, Rodney Howe is uh, obviously looking for observers who have a super SID and he'll take your data once a month as an observer program. Okay, thank I you, Jonathan. Question for you. Okay.